Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 109 on Monday, the 29th of May, 2017. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week we will be talking about Geely buying Lotus and Proton. Dieselgate code has been found. The Coventry Motor Festival and hot Renaults have been listed. And I think we'll get started straight away with the one horse race uh, in which um, somebody completely different won which is Geely have come in and bought Lotus uh, and therefore Proton, who are the owners of Lotus, which uh, is a bit of a shock to us because last we discussed this, Geely had pulled out, PSA were a shoe in uh, there was no one else involved. And then last week we get this uh, bombshell dropped on us, uh, which you know pretty much everyone in this country, in the motoring universe, seemed pretty happy at. I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, yeah, because because when we talked about this a few weeks ago, it was PSA. Geely had dropped out. It was going to be PSA uh, buying in to, to DRB Highcom, uh, who are the, the, the owners of Proton, uh, I say, in turn, the owners of Group Lotus. Um, and, and nobody was expecting this, really. It's not all signed and sealed. Uh, it won't be signed and sealed probably until July. Is when it's expected, uh, but at that point, um, Geely will take forty nine point nine percent of of Proton uh, and fifty one percent stake in Group Lotus. Now, Group Lotus is both uh, Lotus Cars and Lotus Engineering as well in there. But I think everyone's quite chuffed because of the way that Geely's been handling Volvo. Well, yeah, they 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 don't seem to have. They don't seem to have constrained them too much. They seem to have allowed uh, no, they've, you freedom. Yeah. Uh, so. they've, they've said, here's some money that you've asked for. Get on with it, please. Mm. Th- that seems to be that seems to be the, the, the feeling. Uh, they also own London Taxi Company, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, because uh, finally, 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 we're looking at, um, at uh, electric and plug-in hybrid taxis for london too now there is something which i'm interested in putting to you mr clues lotus suv i hadn't thought about it it was mentioned in the car article that is uh that that will be in the show notes and someone popped up with it and says well maybe there'll be a lotus suv how do you feel about that which way um they are uh, an understandable evil. Evil. <laughs> um, well, everyone else is doing. It. You know, Porsche sports cars. They did it. You know, Lamborghini are coming out with one. Um, you know, it, it it seems to be what the buying public want at the mm-hmm. moment. You know, manufacturers cannot make enough varieties uh, for people to consume. Otherwise, things like the X4 and X6 wouldn't sell. And they do somehow. Uh, so, Sorry. quite. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, not going to be a sports car. Uh, they're an SUV at the end of the day. Okay, so they can handle, some can handle better than others. Uh, they can drive more or be driven more enthusiastically. But it brings in cash. So, I mean, if it brings in cash and helps add even more stability so that they can have a wider range of vehicles or a better standard of vehicles. I don't mind it. Yeah, I'm quite happy with uh, with an SUV uh, basically funding funding uh, crazy sporty lotuses is, is, um, in the same way as the KN does for for Porsche. Yeah. Yep. Uh, although there was one other thing. Uh, because they own London Taxi Company, does that mean that they'll become the Lotus Taxi Company? No. No. Probably not. No. And I doubt we're going to see any Lotus engineered Volvos either. I don't no, see well, the need for it. Not I don't see the need for it. Yeah, there, there may be some behind, but there won't be any little stickers saying, here's this Polestar that's also got a Lotus in, because that dilutes badges. Yeah. They, they don't need to. They've got, they've got a, you know, a... a a performance wing to the to the company, so I don't think that, I don't think that's required. 
Yeah, it certainly won't be certainly won't be explicit, but I imagine there'll be some under the under the. Under oh yeah, the, there's bound to be work. sharing of technology and uh, platforms and things like that. Certainly. Yeah, which would be fantastic. Uh, both directions, I'm sure. Mm. Uh, anyway, moving on from that one, because I decided to throw in some fun ones for you there. Um, <laughs> a group of, of experts and enthusiastic amateurs um, in the US and Germany have been scrolling through, um, scrolling through the code from uh, Volkswagen and Audi, um, Volkswagen and Audi firmware images from 2015. Yes, each one supposedly contains about 100 million lines of code. And what they've been doing is they've been trying to see exactly where the um, exactly where the smoking gun uh, was for Dieselgate. So to try and work out which bit made up the defeat device, essentially. Uh, people believe that they have actually worked out what it is, and it's to do with the um, multi, essentially... I can't remember if this is the proper name or not. It probably isn't, but it's the multi-squirt fuel ejection. So it's instead of putting all the diesel in in one into the cylinder, supposedly to make it more. That was that was. You see, that's what you get on a podcast that you don't get in print. Um, then <laughs> what? It's true. Um, then uh, then what it does instead is it pulses the injection to try and make the engine more refined. Uh, the trouble is that in doing that, it has uh, an, an adverse effect on the nitrogen oxide emissions. Uh, the bunch of people who've been going through this have gone through 926 firmware images and believe they've found the potential, and I stress the word potential, uh, defeat device in 406 of those. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, it was mentioned in uh, the article we linked to, I now can't remember where it's from, Ars was, Technica. Was it the Ars Technica one? Thank yep. you. That um, it was mentioned that all the units uh, that the firmware was tested from and all the code on that uh, that's in the firmware in those injection units is actually all from Bosch uh, rather than tweaked by the actual manufacturers. So, uh, yes, yeah. and this and this helps That's... to explain how Bosch were wrapped up in this and got a fine as well, because yeah. that I hadn't understood that yet. I, apart from you know they made certain parts, mm -hmm. but they they also um, in, in Bosch's defence were saying it, when they were in the defence in court, they they made it clear that they'd sent emails saying, do not do this, this will break regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But then they don't mm -hmm. seem to have then gone, well, actually, we've told you this is illegal, so therefore we can't supply it to you. So, hmm, you know, yeah. principles Quite. are all well and good up to a point. <laughs> yes. yes. But, 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 but it's but, not but, the only thing that was found by these people who, who went through all these codes. With the help of, as you say, enthusiasts and forums, uh, enthusiasts <laughs> on forums, um, the uh, the same engine control unit from Bosch is used on the Fiat 500X. Yes. And they haven't found one called uh, Acoustic Controller, which is what it was called in on the Audis and VWs. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, Acoustic Condition, not Controller, Condition. Um, because that's what it originally was there for. It was to make the diesel engines start much nicer and quieter. As yes, we would be expecting like from an Audi. Yes, and as you say, not like, <laughs> not like a tractor in the cold. Um, and uh, the FCA one was less sophisticated, or the the results and the mechanism was less sophisticated than the VW Group one um, because <laughs> this one worked for twenty six minutes forty seconds after the engine start. Remind me again, how long is an emission test? 22 minutes. Mm. No coincidence. Isn't it all. sad that we know the length of the European emissions tests off by heart now? <laughs> Look what you've done to us, Dieselgate. Look we hate you, you Dieselgate. Dieselgate. <laughs> uh, so it brings the Fiat 500 and FCA back in under the microscope. Yep. Um, and... 
uh, I, th I think there's a also an uh, slightly it, not directly con connected with this, but it goes to prove that regulators do not have the capability to deal with uh, investigating cars like they used to because of the hundreds of millions of lines of code. Yeah. Because the NH TSA, the American safety just, road safety one. Yeah, I think it's yes. Uh, T or S maybe the other way around. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, but they um, said because they were being lobbied by um, security um, code people, saying, "Come on, you can't, you can't." possibly look after all this code from a security point of view with connected cars and with autonomous vehicles and all this stuff. And they said, no, no, we don't have the capability of that, but it's all right. We don't need any help either. I said, well, mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you getting on your high horse about that one before. Yeah. So, uh, it just goes to show how incredibly complicated a car is now. And all the, all the, I mean, this echoes back to what we were discussing last week, uh, about the, or the week before the levels of, um, thought that needs to go into making an autonomous vehicle that's on top of creating the car now yeah. that we expect to get in and work perfectly every time yeah it's, it's bad enough as it is thanks without the additional systems on the site totally totally yep. anyway shall we round off investigation corner uh, with some new news yes new news uh, the european commission is now investigating uh, jaguar land rover's plans to open a Slovakian plant. They were given a grant of 125 million euros, which is the maximum that can be given. Um, the European Commission wants to make sure that that is not um, basically uh, going over the top uh, and doesn't actually yeah. move from grant into, is it moving into subsidy is the problem? Yes, yes. Well, they're trying to make sure that there's no so there the, there are no subsidies. The grant uh, and the loan, essentially, that it is um, towards the one billion pound investment at Nitra uh, in Slovakia um, uh, is they're trying to make sure that it is actually necessary and it isn't just well, yeah, yeah we give you 125 million euros um, because because hey it helps you out that they're trying to make sure that it is a, a necessary part of that one billion that one billion pound uh, investment um what the eu is trying to avoid uh, in their words is our subsidy races between member states uh, and they need to check if the plan support is really necessary quote unquote in both cases no, um, the the, the uh, subsidy race will happen after Brexit, after a hard yeah, well, Brexit. Yeah, well, remember all of this stuff was signed <laughs> off. It was all agreed and started, and all signed off and began well before the Brexit vote. So, so mm. this is not a direct result. No, um, but watch how it will. If if oh, watch it turn our, into our our negotiation team. Uh, good no, luck to them. Before him. we go down this one, if, if our if our negotiation team don't come out with a deal which is uh, making it a level playing field for manufacturers uh, to build and export vehicles from this country back into Europe, then I think we can expect to see a full-on race, probably backed by the European Commission. Um, yeah, probably, actually. People going that way, desperate for it. Anyway... Before we get sidetracked into politics, because it's too easy to get sidetracked into politics these days, generally, and goodness knows it's... it's I'm electing not to, though. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you have completely put me off my thread. Thanks for that. So, yes. So, they want to make sure it is it, that the aid is necessary as part of this, this billion pound investment. Uh, the factory will, should be able to build up to 150,000 of vehicles, vehicles a year. But the part about the state aid, which is actually where I was, now I've remembered where I got to, is state aid, um, they're, they're checking for sneaky state aid, uh, including uh, looking at the transfer of land from the Slovakian government to JLR as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's all, it's all some fun there, mm. I think. 
Right, this this next one that you're going to talk about, I wasn't sure whether this was actually follow-up, but I think it was long enough ago, and this is a slightly different take on it, that it is actually no, new th- news. Th- this isn't, this isn't follow-up. This is new news because they had implemented what we talked about at the follow-up, <laughs> and now they've changed it, and therefore it's new. Should we stop teasing people? Yes. So, Ecotricity. Uh, you remember that last year they introduced a... They introduced uh, a, a, I was going to say a new charge. They introduced a charge for using their their Ecotricity uh, EV charging points at motorway service stations. And that was met, if I remember correctly, that was met with uh, welcoming cheers, general jubilation across the country, and no one getting slightly bent out of shape about stuff they previously said that they would and wouldn't do. Yeah, so originally there was... yes. Or it was the opposite of that, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So anyway, you remember, because the reason we talked about it so much was because there was a backlash at the initial £5 pounds with a 20-minute limit charge um, for vehicles. Uh, In the end, after after that initial backlash, what they introduced was £6, uh, and that got you 30 minutes of charge within 24 hours from starting. That. So you could do two 15-minute charges, and you wouldn't get charged twice. Um, and they were also going to ban FEVs, weren't they? <clears throat> they weren't going to ban FEVs, but the, this was as a reaction to people parking their FEVs there, uh, plugging them in to get a teaspoonful of electricity whilst they went inside uh, and and had a business meeting for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, uh, blocking up one of the, the, the limited charging points. So that was... That was the real reason for bringing this in, and and they, they threatened that they were going to anyway. Uh, so they've changed it. There is now going to be a three pound connection fee, and then seventeen pence per unit of electricity thereafter, um, which puts it, which puts it about the same cost, certainly on the per unit part, as charging at home, uh, if you got to charge at home during the day. And uh, just smacks to me that wait, they wait, still wait. don't know what their business model is. Well, yes and no. Hang on a tick. Still a maximum charge length of 45 minutes. Um, but customers who are Ecotricity customers for the home as well, and this is why I, I, I don't quite agree with you, uh, won't have to pay that that £3. So essentially, I believe that what their business, what most of these are, and most of the charging points are really are very much advertising for ecotricity, getting the term, e- the name of the brand ecotricity out there. And then what they actually want to be doing is um, what they actually want to be doing is providing all your home uh, electricity uh, as well as your 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 vehicular electricity um, from renewable sources. He says, sounding like an ecotricity advert. But um, but no, I think that's that's the case, uh, and that will be introduced from the twenty sixth of June. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I, mm. No, I'm not overly impressed with Ecotricity's way of doing things recently. Got to say, there are a limited number of there are a limited number of charging companies, mm-hmm. Andrew, and. Um, I think it's a case of taking which charging company you can at the time. Now, remember that that what they've done here is they've looked, they've seen there's a problem for our loyal customers, uh, our our biggest users. They've tried to address it. Uh, They've addressed it in one way and said, well, actually, this has helped an awful lot. So let's try and dial this back a little bit and just see where the happy medium is. I don't know whether it's actually... I suppose suppose if 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 I take off my grumpy hat. Yeah. Uh, and look at this balance, they are reacting relatively quickly to customer feedback and actual usage. So from that point of view, it is refreshing to see a company do that sort of thing. Um, So Captain Cynicism will uh, take a step back for a moment. Back in the cupboard. (laughs) And I think this is a perfect time to move on to the next article. I think it's past being a perfect time to move on to the next one. Yes, engine downsizing, Andrew. (laughs) Well, Volkswagen's boss has come out and said um, engine downsizing is is going to have to end. There's, it can't continue because emissions uh, and it will cost too much and, oh, it's not good, basically. 
which is something that had been said quite a bit recently in the whole Dieselgate and the what is what has been the couched, spin-off from it? couched as stricter emission controls that have they been approved yet by the way or are they still arguing uh, about not them? to my knowledge so they're still they're still uh, lobbying going on about them okay uh but it just seems to say and i need to say this not you it just seems to show that mazda appeared to have this worked out ages ago which is why they never went to very tiny engines with lots of turbos and superchargers and all sorts of jiggery pokery slapped on it and why they never released a diesel in america actually because they didn't think they could hit the emissions required no they got darn close to it Mm. so it goes to show how incredibly tricky it is considering what they can do with like a one liter petrol engine what power can come out of that now what you know miles per gallon and all that sort of stuff that Mm. their manufacturers are basically going it's just too hard now. It's getting too hard, so we're going to have to go back to bigger engines that we can control. But if it's a bigger engine, though, does that will that mean that there's less stress on the engines? Well, normally they're not does, having yeah. to work as hard to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, that's well, that's going to be an interesting test for us over the next week, actually. Mm. If you think about it. Um, but uh, but yeah, well, that's the theory. That, that's the theory is you can get just about the same economy from a big engine if you're keeping it really quite low stressed as you do with a small engine going all the time keeping it keeping it running all uh, uh, yeah that's the theory mm. okay but i think this this now we're talking about engines i think this moves us nicely on to uh, another one that was found this week well it does because uh there was one and this is from this is from autocar an article written by steve cropley um, talking about a Leamington, sorry, I was going to say a Leamington Spa, a Royal Leamington Spa-based uh, company, uh, Camcon Automotive, uh, who have come up with an electronic valve train system for petrol engines. Um, uh, in this, yeah, I'm getting tongue-tied because it's complicated and technical, and I'm trying to make sure I address it all in the right order. Uh, there is a video in the article which helps to demonstrate what it does. Yeah, sensible people would have watched the video. Uh, so <laughs> basically what happens here is that you get rid of the timing belts and, and chains and you uh, you separate the whole valve train from the speed of the crankshaft and the crankshaft, which is, is kind of, at the minute, they're all sort of related uh, related together. What that means is that the lift, the timing, and the duration of all of the valves uh, can be controlled independently uh, and, of course, infinitely in between. So instead of having these these steps in variable valve timing, then um, then then everything can be can be completely. Whilst it's a digital system, it can be completely analog uh, while you're between. Ding. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. So all of that can be changed. Now, you can do that to really tune the engine in ways it's not been possible in the past to be incredibly drivable, uh, to be incredibly smooth, to, 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 to change its characteristics depending on the load, depending on throttle position, all of these kind of things. And it should open up uh, an awful lot of um, flexibility in there for engineers to, to basically make good stuff. Um, uh, so that we can have super economical, super powerful cars, but petrol engines as well, and petrol engines, which as well. uh, considering you know how evil diesel is mm. in every in everybody's mind, uh, this this can only be a good thing. Yeah, um, the one word word of the day, by the way, comes comes from this article. So thank you very much. The Oh no, I can't remember I'm writing there. The world <laughs> the word is desmodromic. Uh the valve, uh, which means that there is a positive close as well as a positive action uh on these valves. So instead of it going just pulling and then being being returned to its initial place by a spring, then even that closure uh is completely controllable as well. 
in there. Now, the ID, the technology has had some help from JLR. I'm sure the Slovakian government weren't involved in that whatsoever. Um, <laughs> and if it's adopted by by one of these by one of the component, one of the big suppliers like Valeo or Bosch, um, it should only be two to three years from production. It does sound very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by this sort of incredibly clever uh, m ways that people are able to get more and more out of engines. Um, it just yeah. it, it does fascinate me, I'm partly because I am so ignorant in this area, just this area, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I, I, hope it, I hope it happens because, you know, if, if it can be done economically, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it sounds incredibly clever. It's a, hopefully another piece of fantastic British inventiveness. Yep. In there. Anyway, it's got to that point in the stage. It point in the stage. That stage. Blah, 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 that point in the show. <laughs> oh, I'll take a run up. Anyway, it's got to that point in the show where I remind you, remind you of our Patreon, a way that you can support the Motoring Podcast by donating a small amount uh, every month. If you'd like to know more, then head to motoringpodcast.com uh, and click on the orange Become a Patreon button uh, right there at the top of the front page. Bryce, again, if you're a page, Radio Patreon, then thank you so very much. It really is appreciated. Um, and, of course, that next round of donations should come out of your bank accounts in two days' time. I was going to say tomorrow, which it will be by the time this gets watched. I know what I mean. Um, so, yes, if you're a radio patron, thank you very, very much. Uh, of course, we understand that not everybody is in a, pos in a, a position to, to donate money. Uh, so if, you're not, if you could, please um, remember to like, rate, and leave feedback via the podcast player of your choice and to tell your friends, then that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so one of the things we're up to next is we're off to Coventry Motor Fest this weekend. Yay! Yay! It's that weekend of the year again, but we're not going to be the only people there uh, because Paul Hollywood is going to be there as well. Everybody's favorite gruff baker uh, <laughs> will be there. <laughs> she couldn't think of a better description for Paul Hollywood. And racing driver... Um, Paul Hollywood, yes. <laughs> that was only going to go downhill from there in my mind. Oh. Yeah, so he'll be driving a British Touring Car uh, Championship of Vauxhall Astra on the sprint course uh, at um, uh, at the Coventry Moto Fest. Uh, yep, yeah, it's a podium-winning car. It's going to be great. It's going to be somebody else to, to look and see. Now, the great thing about... Uh, Coventry Motor Fest is just the sheer volume of interesting vehicles that are around the place and the fact that they are all mixed up, uh, which is intentional on the part of the organizers, uh, so that you see a little bit of everything. So you'll have a Hillman Imp parked beside uh, an Ascari or something. I don't think we've ever actually seen an Ascari there. But um, but the, the, the mix is fantastic. There's always some, uh, at least one unique vehicle um, uh, on show, doing the, the drive-bys on that closed section of um, of the ring road. Mm. And it's going to be fantastic. I, I love it. It's a great event for us. If you are going, um, uh, if you are going, then uh, give us a shout. Uh, and and let, uh, if you're going and you fancy bumping into us. Yes, buying, I think we need us, to. Buying us a, a caveat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> bumping into us, buying us a lemonade or something. Um, then, then, then do get in touch and let us know um, all the usual contact details at the end of the show. I think I've killed that one. In fact, I think I've mashed it, jumped on it, and yes, that story is now an X story. <laughs> well, we have been very remiss recently, Alan. Uh, well, slightly. We have. We have not updated or reminded people that there have been updates from Dolly Wobbler, Ian Seabrook, and the Hubnut Fleet. That's because he gets all embarrassed when we do this. Does he? Yes. Ah, well, However, it's like now. Yeah. If only I'd known. <laughs> but there have been significant changes to the fleet. 
In the show notes will be three videos to give you a flavor of what's happened. He has uh, bought a car, got rid of the car, bought another car. Or no, has he got rid of the yeah, car? Yeah, yeah, taken the Yes, he has. Okay. Yes. He's, yes, uh, he's struggled with them. He's, he's fought them tooth and nail, some of them. Um, and he's he seems to have ended up with... Uh, I think this could be quite an interesting one because it looks like he's going into areas he doesn't normally get into. Yeah, like up to his elbows and engine bits. Yes. Um, so, yes, the, the damp Daimler of Doom has come and gone. Um, <laughs> the, the walk around of that car was really quite quite something. Um, and in its place is a blue bluebird mm. um yes uh so malcolm campbell was not involved in it in any way shape or form um <laughs> not the aerodynamics yes. <laughs> no there's well, anyway he's now he is now the proud and i think he's still proud uh custodian of one of Happy. Uh, yeah of one of sunderland's sunderland's finest there is one tiny little problem uh, and that's that it, it's on the head gasket bears more resemblance to Jarlsberg than any sort of way of separating oil and water. So there's quite a bit of work going on there uh, that he's trying to do himself. And uh, the the update videos are, are great, as usual, Ian. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, been, it's been too long since we've mentioned he's got a video out. So mm-hmm. you, you've got some catch-up to do, please, listeners, um, and do go and enjoy because they are entertaining. Well, we're talking it's, about- it's, it's, it's very real is what you see, mm-hmm. which well, is nice. Whilst you can carry talking, on now. <laughs> thank you. So whilst we're talking about Ian, uh, it's worth remembering that he is, of course, uh, editor of Retro Japanese. Next edition should be coming out relatively soonish, I think, uh, which is cool because it should have Japfest, uh, it should have photos and coverage from uh, Japfest at Silverson. Did you happen to be there, Alan? I happened to be there, yes. Yes. It was a good day out. Mm, it looked it. Looked it. It was a fantastic day out, actually. Really good. So thank you, Ian. Mm. List of the week, I think, Alan. It is. It's list of the week, and this one comes from. You'll never guess, or regular mm-hmm. listeners. It comes from uh, Major Gav. Well, uh, we oh, have thrown the gauntlet down for others to come up with. We do excellent lists, and it's still not been taken up. So it's your own fault. You come no, up with I, good I stuff. You will. You will be featured here. Yes. So get on with it, people. Uh, so yes, it's. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it is it is the the major gav list uh, this week, and it is the greatest hot Renault ever. So uh, everything from Dauphine to a Megan uh, Megan uh, RSs via Renault Eight Gordinis via the one that I like best, which is the Renault Five Alpine Stroke Gordini, and I actually had a Corgi toy car in exactly the same uh, a Corgi, uh, one of the larger Corgi. Uh, uh, Renault fives in exactly the same color scheme as the the R5 Alpine that's shown in the picture there. GT turbos, uh, twelve Gordinis, Clio Sport V6 is the lot. It's it's a major gav list. It's comprehensive. It is full of nerdiness, um, and it's it's absolutely genius. Yes. Yes. It is Although excellent. I'm still a little bit wary about how the Renault 5 V6, uh, Renault 5, Renault 25 V6 Turbo gets in there, which is just, it is fantastically 1980s French. Really, it's the kind of, you just don't see them on the auto route being as nutty as they, they, they were. Well, talking of uh, large Renaults that you don't see much, I saw a Safran yesterday. Oh, Safran, wow, you, you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Safran. Safran. Um, and uh, it sounded sick. Ooh. It, it, mm. it's, sorry, is that sick in the way that Lewis Hamilton? No, not, not as in or is that the way sick children. as in it was unwell. It was, it was not a happy car. Right. Uh, there was only minute, there was hardly any rust on it or anything, and it was and it looked in pretty good nick, but the it had, didn't think the oily bits had been loved, I think is how I put it. Uh, but I was I was happy to see one. It would be interesting. You could do an engine swap from from one of those to. Are they not? I believe they're incredibly closely related. You could do it from those from a 
from a 350Z. Or even better would be a Nissan Murano. Because that should be the same today. engine. I saw one of those today, actually. Really? Well. Yes. Well, it, it should be the same engine, roughly speaking. Mm. I think it's the, the but the uh, but the Murano one's like half a liter bigger or something. But I believe it's all the same underneath in there. Uh, hence, hence gags about certain Nissans being powered by people carrier engines. Okay. Well, they used it in the uh, they used it in the Espace as well. Ah, right. I'll keep you up to date. You, you, you're not good on your Nissan engines, are you? No, no. Sensible, grown up people with lives aren't. And me, and you. <laughs> Which brings us, goodness me, this has been a struggle tonight. And finally, two. Uh, yeah, that brings us to the end. Finally, this week. This week. It's the Rolls Royce Sweptail. Uh, did you see this, Andrew? It was unveiled. I know that you've been busy all weekend. Uh, it was unveiled on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday at the. He says scrolling back twenty seventh Saturday um, at the uh, Villa d'Este uh, in Italy. Rolls Royce unveiled this this. Uh, I don't know what the word is really. It's a coach built, bespoke, Co bespoke coach built, unique, <laughs> very unique. Um, uh, sort of phantom, a uh, phantom based car. <laughs> I don't even think the car does it justice. Motor vehicle is possibly the closest you can get. Conveyance, yes, um, conveyance. It is. It is essentially a a. a Phantom uh, coupe. I hope I've got the right terminology in there. With the where instead of the usual kind of finish at the end, the it it's it's rump, its tail goes down and follows follows the kind of style of some of the 1930s supercars, kind of coming almost to a point at the back. Mm. Uh, the front's been the front's been been changed slightly too. It's it's been slightly refashioned. Um, it's a bit square. It's got a kind of frame to it, which I, I which is, is is a bit more challenging aesthetically, even than the, than the rear, because it, it's very different. But it's it's a fantastic creation. I, I don't know whether I like it or I dislike it, but either way, it remains a fantastic creation. I think it's amazing that that this kind of thing can still be be created in a kind of bespoke fashion and can be. Um, and can be, you know, yeah, because that it, it evokes those nice. cars back from, uh, you know, the 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 fifties where somebody had, you know, we had the same base, but then there was all these different body styles put on it's, top, but not, but these yeah. each one was almost unique because the customer had said, well, actually, what I want is this or something like that. Um, instead of it being a different model just based on the same thing these were you know they had the same power plant and all the rest of it and they just they just created a different exterior and and it's it's wonderful from that point of view i mean it, it's not my cup of tea but no. and, and it's not the work of 10 minutes either because no. uh yeah nothing is with the rolls royce well no exactly the, i mean we've uh, if you've not heard the the um oh i've forgotten the chap's name it's james isn't it um for, from Rolls Royce, the the, uh, the rear view, then then you should because I think it gives a fascinating insight into the um, into the way that they they work as a company. Uh, but even the the lines, I mean, I've got the press release uh, sitting here in front of me, and it, it when the paragraph starts, over the course of a number of years, Taylor and his team of designers engaged with the client to one in a wonderfully intellectual journey as they work together to realize the customer's distinct vision and bring it to life. You know, you, you don't just make two or three visits to do this and go, yeah, I want something a bit like this, make it. You know, this... this yes. the, They're not the slapping on a, a few bits of plastic and knocking an aluminium wing in here or there. <laughs> this is this is not a Swiss-built stick-on carbon fiber kit, all right? Okay? This is this is this is proper coach work uh, that, as I say, has taken taking place uh, uh, over a lot of time. The detailing is is quite quite impressive. Um, one of the things that, that people people spent a lot of time focusing on the exterior, but but when you you read through uh, some of the detail about this, and you see that you know there's there are 
there are special stowage areas for carbon fiber for uh, a carbon fiber briefcase in each side, which pulls out in a drawer so that you can then take it out. And somebody's going to tell me there was an alpha male that had that instead of a glove box. Um, but you know, there's 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 a lot of of detail on the inside. The interior, there's now there are no back seats. There is instead a a, large, a, a luggage a luggage space on the interior as well for 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 touring. Um, and there is a there is a a hat. There is a special shelf for hats in there as well. Um, it's it's Don't quite something. Got to look after your hat. You do have to look after your hats. I, I quite often have have that problem. Um, but it's it's intriguing. I, I would love to see it in the in the flesh. I'm pleased to see that people have already seen it on the road. Yes, I saw somebody tweet something that earlier. Yeah, it was um, they did. They had seen it on the the motorway, and it looked it looked. It, it's difficult to describe because I'm 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 not against nor am I for. I am just it, it's I I think it's an amazing piece of engineering, but I'm not suddenly gushing over it. But I I, I don't hate it either. If you know what I mean. No, I, I'm the same. I'm in the same boat with aesthetically. I'm in the same boat. I think it's it's beautifully done. Obviously, whether or not you. You like the outcome. Well, that's what I was going to say. I'd love to. I'd love to sit down with the team and watch how they went through the process of that, and and ask them to describe. You know how how did we do, how did you get from because you know I've worked in architecture, so I know what designers do in theory. I I'm not a designer. Ah! I was no longer near. I was nowhere <laughs> near a designer. Yeah, get the crayons out. Yeah, well, that's it. You lot, you it. lot have the fancy crayons and your bit of arty farty paper. And off you go and do a bit of a pastel sketch, and then you give it to schmucks like me and say, "No, just make that real, please." I go, "No, no I know I have to go and do lunch with my cravat and my uh, my glorious wine, and now I need to dream up the next wonderful creation." You're driving yourself, yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> but seriously, I would like to sit and, and dis just get them to run me through the process because. I'm fascinated how someone goes from, you know, that to come out with this, and yeah. and the thick the steps that go along because it won't be a, you know there'll be some fairly obvious things that we expect, but it'll be little nuances that uh, a really talented designer and design team can. You know, so when they're saying that they work in conjunction with the owner, that they'll be able to get these out and and understand what the owner really really wants and it's that sort of skill that um i think steps people apart from you know the, the from the the rank and file designers basically yeah, yeah I, I agree with you um the other part about this is what's really interesting is that this will also inform rolls royce they'll be able to you know by un by going to this level of understanding admittedly with a even for Rolls Royce, a small percentage of their customers will inform them as to the aspirations of the rest of those customers, or a large proportion of the rest of those customers. Hmm. So, I think that's really that's really cool. Now, there is one thing which we haven't mentioned yet, and that is the price. I, I didn't want to know. <laughs> it is rumored that it cost about ten million pounds. Okay, but now you see that's the initial. How much? kind of reaction but you know reading <laughs> reading in the over many years over these kind of things then you know people's time and effort and skills skills that could, that could be developing another rolls royce model have to be used in that oh i can the see other, how it costs other, that much the other part is but my, my question is the, the the person spent that much how long are they going to keep that car I. I mean, I would I mean, imagine, we're, we're, talking, I would imagine. we're talking about a different level of what we operate in. Obviously, you know, no, we're talking no. about there's far too many noughts on the end of everything to compare with us. But if so, it it's how do you get your head around and go? Yes, I will spend that much money. Then does that person keep the car for twenty years? Do they keep it for twenty minutes? What how if they don't, whose fault is it? It's this. They've invested. No, no, years. no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm I just, would I'm imagine just... that this is going to be, if not a forever car, then a significant period of time. Yeah, I, again, I, I know it's not it's nobody else's fault. You know, I'm not saying there's a fault. I'm just curious 
does somebody go through this and go right? Well, I've done that project. I would like a new project because I, I, I've just done this one. So I go. I, I, I think you can keep your project. Mm. I think if that's your project, you can keep your projects, mm. and you, you'd move on to another one. But someone was pointing out that actually, when you look at it in terms of the alternative things that the the people with significant amounts of money can spend their money on, it's quite cheap. Here he had. He came up with a cart now. This was something that he and Rolls Royce had designed together and that got on Saturday morning, my Twitter stream, just about everyone had a comment on it. Some were, and what was really interesting was how divided they were because some were really positive. Some were like, oh, it's horrible. Um, but some were always like that. Uh, but there was... But he got a reaction. But he got a reaction. It's like art. That, that's art. It's giving you a reaction. But... There was that, and it was right around the world. It can't just have been in the UK because this was unveiled a major thing. Now, that was £10 million. To get a boat, a ship that people, because it better bleeding be a ship by this point, <laughs> that is going to impress people, you're talking at least £20 million. If you are an aeroplane that's going to really impress people, you're talking about at least £50 million. So... If you're in the business of impressing people, or if you're in the business of, of wanting your vision, then having your vision in an automobile is, is really, really quite good value. Mm. No matter what we might think. And, you know, I think that if he's prepared to invest that much of his time, of his effort, of his money, in a piece of automotive art because god knows we don't actually see enough of those these days no then i think that that's fantastic i think it's wonderful i really do yes it's a bit ugly at the front but i think it's wonderful yeah but the, the fact that someone's gone to that effort that's the wonderful yeah. bit yeah uh, and that's why i wanted to talk about it not to ridicule the price not to not to go how could people do this never hat rack and stuff but because i think that the the whole process and the investment is superb yes i agree Oh dear, we've agreed. Oh, it's it's, this week's going to be cataclysmic because we're going to meet up as well. I know, I know. So we've, we've got lots of stuff to do this week. If the lots universe ends, it's our fault, everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, quite. Speaking of stuff to do this week, uh, as I said to you earlier on, Andrew, I'm going to try and get some videos out this week. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Dun. A long way we're also to... hoping to record another... Another special edition? Which is related to the videos. Um, mm. Yes, because I did quite a lot of driving one day last week. Um, so it might be one, it might be two special editions um, because there's lots to be said about so much stuff. Um, but we'll see how that goes. And that's about it for this week, isn't it? It is. Anything I've forgotten? No. Good. In which case, don't forget that between now and next week, you can give us any feedback and share your thoughts for the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Uh, don't forget our Patreon, please, um, at, which you can get to via motoringpodcast.com. And if you do fancy seeing if you can meet up with us at uh, Coventry Motor Fest, then please give us a shout. Andrew, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Uh, the best way would be via Twitter. If you search for Crack Windscreen, you will find me there standing on the bumper of a car. And if people want to get in touch with you, Alan, to hopefully meet up at Coventry Motor Fest, what's the best way to do that? Uh, best way is on Twitter again at AJP Bradley, where you will find a picture of my Isuzu Veracross. We'll be back next week. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring. <laughs>